Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Caliber. Today's guest tells us why the bond market is so attractive for income seekers and where the team has been focusing their resources to target a 5% yield. I'm Chris Sarley, and today we're joined by Vincent McIntyre, co-manager of the elite-rated Aegon Diversified Monthly Income Fund. Thank you for joining us today, Vincent. Hi, Chris. Um, let's start with the profile of the fund. I mean, it aims to produce an income of 5%, which in you know recent history would sound incredibly attractive. But and I, I guess two things. One, have you done that in the past? And has that changed now when perhaps the, the world has changed and, and achieving 5% is perhaps not quite what it used to be? Well, indeed, uh, you know, it's always been my view that why aim for, uh, you know, a 4% uh, when, uh, you know, a 5% income means that you get 25% more income. Um, uh, you know, who doesn't want a, a 25% pay rise? Um, but you're right, for most of the last 10 years, getting to 5% uh, has been something that clients have maybe thought was was too high and that we, perhaps we could achieve it, but we need to take on um, a lot of risk to do so. We've been able to deliver it, uh, and the way that we've done that is by looking harder for and investing into securities that, uh, first of all, have to meet our high standards of financial soundness, but they can have a yield that is anywhere between 2% on the low end and 7 or 8% on the high end. We don't have to have securities that all yield 5%. It's the, the overall portfolio yield needs to be around 5 And that's just been a continuous process. As markets change, as yields move up and down, uh, we rotate the, the portfolio. Today, what's interesting uh, and different is that after last year, 2022, um, there's been a big change in bond markets. And so there's a lot more yield available in those markets than there has been for most of the last 10 years. To give you an example, investment grade bonds, uh, which have only about 12 months or so ago had a yield that was less than 2%. Today, you can get a portfolio of investment grade bonds with a yield of 5% or even 6%. Um, so that's a big, big change in, in, in a relatively short space of time. So to sum up, the, the 5% target, it's achievable from here, and the mix of assets in the portfolio will be a little different from in the past a bit more fixed income and a bit more in equities that probably have a lower yield, but better growth potential. So that's the beauty of investing in multi-asset, the flexibility of it. So I think it's best to maybe just touch on that now. I mean, when it, when it comes to bonds, you, you, maybe maybe just talk about the structure of the fund at the moment. When it comes to bonds, if you, you've increased the allocation, what, what areas are you favoring and why? Why have you, why have you increased those certain parts of the market? Well, mainly for um, uh, we had a low allocation to bonds because there was so little yield available until uh, recent times. Uh, and so what we've been favoring is bonds where we, we had less uh, exposure to, such as investment grade that I just mentioned. Uh, and that's the area we've had the biggest proportionate increase in, in the portfolio. We also own some uh, what are called uh, high yield bonds. Those are um, uh, they have a higher yield than investment grade. They also involve a bit more credit risk uh, uh, when you invest in them uh, because the companies that issue those bonds are not as safe and secure as the ones that issue investment grade bonds. So we've got exposure there too. Um, uh, and we've been a bit worried about inflation. As, as most people know, inflation, particularly in the UK, has been very high, persistently staying high. Uh, we're still worried about it. it is coming down. And so we've been careful not to add, for example, longer dated bonds, including government bonds, because they are very sensitive to uh, moves in inflation. I mean, all bonds are sensitive to moves in inflation, but particularly those, those ones. Um, but when we do take credit risk, we do have to manage that carefully. Um, one, you can lose money and invest in bonds. Companies can go bust. So you do need to do uh, credit research, fundamental analysis of companies to see that they will, if you lend them money, that they will pay it back. But that's what we've been doing in bonds, increasing it and focusing on quality um, uh, with a, a lower exposure to uh, interest rate risk. Okay, I'm going to come back to a couple of the other asset classes in a little bit, but in terms of themes, I just want to touch on obviously the multi-asset nature of the fund. I mean, I believe one of the things you've been doing recently is reducing uh, banking exposure. Maybe that's an area of the market that's had a lot of sort of negative sentiment for a number of years. Maybe, maybe just talk to us about that. Has it been in equities and bonds or just one sort of specific asset class? Maybe just give us your, your view on what's been happening in the banking sector. Yeah, look, banks, the banking sector, as you quite rightly say, is a challenging sector um, for, for investors. They're, you know, it's, it's this kind of uh, uh, ironic, ironic thing that banks are a 
a really important part of the economy. They have a role in lending to consumers, to companies, to help economies grow. Um, but but the ba bank's balance sheets often are complicated. They're not necessarily very transparent, and and the controversy is never seems never very far away from banks. So um, uh, you know it is a, a challenging sector. We're fortunate that we have some. Uh, analysts, some uh, ex experts who look very closely at the balance sheets of banks, and that helps us, we think, to to make um, uh, some smart decisions when investing there. For a number of years, we've had quite a low exposure to the equity of banks, uh, but we have had a meaningful exposure to bonds, um, and, and that's because um, we felt that in a low interest rate environment, uh, it was quite difficult for banks to make a profit. and. It's the, if you're investing in equities, you hope that the, the, the bank is going to make a good profit and, and return that to you in dividends and capital growth. But, but on the bond side, when you invest in bonds, really you're just lending money. You expect that you pay interest while you lend that money to the bank, uh, but you just want your money back. It's a different mindset. And so we've been quite happy to have exposure to the bonds um, uh, rather than equities. Now, right up to date, you're quite right. Um, you know, the recent blow ups in the US where some regional banks, Silicon Valley Bank was one of them, but a number of regional banks in the US have got into trouble. Um, their business models weren't robust enough for this higher interest rate environment. There was then uh, in Europe, uh, some people may have heard about Credit Suisse. It had to be a forced takeover by its Swiss uh, uh, competitor, UBS, uh, by the Swiss regulator. So that's brought controversy and volatility and uncertainty against the banking sector and, and has spooked uh, investors. We, we reduced some of our small exposures to bank equity. We've held on to our, our bank bonds, our bank credit. Um, we're not adding to it at this stage, uh, although you know you could argue that there are opportunities there um, given that prices in both equity and bonds have fallen a bit. So uh, yeah, a, an interesting sector. Some people just stay away from it, but for a fund like ours looking for yield uh, uh, to get to that 5% target, bank, bank credit continues to be an important component. Okay, I'm going to turn to equities now. Um, maybe let's just um, talk about two ways. Firstly, could you maybe just explain how the, the structure of your um, equities exposure works in terms of the global and the, the high dividend sort of uh, sleeves you have within there? And then I, I believe you've been re reducing your global equity income exposure. Is that in preference for any sort of regional or country specific income requirements? Maybe just give us a, a view on that as well, please. Sure. Um, yeah, you're quite right. So we, 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 what we try to do with everything in this fund is we try not to reinvent the wheel. We try to uh, and make use of all of the good ideas that uh, come out of the different investment teams that we have at Aegon Asset Management, the equity side, the credit side, the alternative side, and, and we feed them into this uh, multi-asset portfolio. Um, so from an equity point of view, we have a, a, a global equity program that, that investors can invest in themselves. Um, there was a fund there, um, and we use that's the core of our equity exposure. But then we supplement that with some uh, additional equities that is held in, for example, Japanese, European, UK equity programs that we run. We, we cherry pick some of the stocks out of there to help us to get to our 5% yield objective. So that's basically, it's two components, um, the main one being the global equity component. Now, you're right to say that um, the headline allocation to equities in the fund has been reduced in, in recent months. Um, that's that's really because that as the bond market as I talked about earlier, as, as as the bond market has changed and has been much more yield available in the bond market, we've we've taken some of our exposure to equities and and, and equity like assets down and put that into the bond market because that the bond market assets are less volatile than than less risky than the equity market uh, assets. So we've done that um, and uh, you know it's the focus where we where we've adjusted down the most. Is in the, uh, the, the what we call the high dividend equity uh, 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 component. Um, we've we've got about 29 percent currently in the equi the two equity components, and the vast majority of that is in the global global equity component, with only about two or three percent in the high dividend equity component. Okay. Um, let's also talk about alternatives. They have been integral to anyone wanting to achieve a reasonable yield. I think in the past few years, but perhaps not as important. Now, I'm quite keen to get your take on, I mean, infrastructure, real estate, there's, there's nothing wrong with these asset classes. It just tends to be that perhaps some of the more traditional ones look far more attractive now. Has that is that a sort of notion that's been played out in your portfolio? Well, I think we definitely, look. we've been reducing, uh, as we've actually done more reduction in the infrastructure and real estate than we've done in the equity part of the portfolio. Uh, 
um, with all of those reductions going into uh, the higher bond allocation. Um, uh, but you know, it, it, real estate has had a very tough time last year, um, and and is continuing to struggle. Part of the reason for that, a large part of the reason for that, is that many of these businesses really re have have had a, a long period of time where being able to borrow money cheaply um, uh, has has allowed them to to run quite a successful business by just borrowing cheaply and then collecting rents on properties, whether they are um, uh, warehouses, offices, uh, residential even. Um, and and that, that gap between the rental yield and the, the cost of borrowing is essentially the business model of, of many of these property companies, with the cost of borrowing going up a lot. And yes, rents have maybe gone up, but it's difficult for rents to go up too far, even though inflation is is, is where it is. So, so these business models have become much more, uh, well, less profitable than they were uh, for a bit the last 10 years or so. So, so that's that's a, a good fundamental reason to be reducing your exposure. Uh, there are still some good investments. Uh, some of them have been marked down very significantly and look like quite attractive entry points if you aren't currently invested there. Um, but, but, but then more broadly away from real estate, some of those comments I've just made about funding, cheap funding, and 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 um, uh, that being the business model. Some of that applies in the infrastructure area as well. We we had quite a lot of exposure to European utilities, for example. We still have exposure, but we brought that down um, uh, in, in recent months, and we've invested the proceeds into into the bond market, where we're getting similar yields to what we had in those infrastructure investments, uh, but but with a a lot less uncertainty around those yields because they're bond yields rather than equity type yields. But the, the, in terms of a sort of way of evaluating alternatives, it's, it's not as if it's a case of you only go into them when nothing else looks attractive. It's more the, a case of, you know, bonds do look very attractive at the moment rather than there's any issues with alternatives as, a, as an investment. It, that, that, that's the, is that one of the reasons for, for the change in allocation? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think um, uh, I, if there'll be people out there that have big allocations alternatives. We're certainly not saying, you know, sell them and and, and put it all into bonds. Uh, it's just in the balance of our portfolio um, at the moment, this is what looks the right thing for us to do. A bit more in bonds, a bit less in alternatives. And actually, we want the, 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 the growth driver of the portfolio to remain equities rather than alternatives. Um, uh, so, so that that's why we're getting, you know, we're we're solving a big equation for our fund. Uh, everyone who's got a different mandate with a different objective will will solve that equation differently for for their needs. But um, uh, we'll still continue to own uh, some of these infrastructure assets in the portfolio because we like diversification. We don't just want to own two assets, equities and bonds, um, uh, and, and so we will own them, just less of them than we had in the past. Okay, and um, just in terms of your positioning at the moment in terms of the outlook obviously we've gone from an environment of where it's almost a dearth of income opportunities to one where sort of the sweet shops almost open for business and there's almost too much yeah. to choose from to a certain degree and um, do you have to position your portfolio in that backdrop for sort of any scenario because we don't know if it's going to be recession or not whether inflation is going to be sticky or not how, how, is that something that has to be factored in when you build the portfolio in terms of that outlook at the moment that we don't really have a direction in markets yeah, the top down uh, the top down view of, of economies and markets at the moment is one that uh, gives us reason to be cautious. Um, uh, you know, we it's, it is difficult to predict whether there's going to be a, enough of an economic slowdown to 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 lead to a recession. You know, the, it's possible that the central banks engineer a soft landing and we don't get recession. But it's fair to say that. The, the, the more than half, the majority of people observing these things, talking about these things, think there will be some form of recession. How we deal with that in the portfolio is to just be positioned more cautiously. We're not selling out of all of our equities. As I said already, we've got about um, 28, 29% today in, in, in equities. We think those companies are, are really good companies that can survive a difficult environment. Um, uh, the share prices might move down a bit if, it's, if the environment gets more difficult, but we're in there for the long term. And then the bond part of the portfolio, which is around 50% of the assets now, um, I mean, there's some potential credit risk in there that could have a difficult time in a really bad recession, but we think that half of the portfolio is pretty solid, quite defensive, where when it comes to uh, a more difficult economic environment. So that's how we, we try to deal with it. We try to stay invested, because ultimately we're still trying to get income to deliver to, to, to investors uh, on a monthly basis. Um, so we stay invested, but, but adjust to a more cautious stance. And, and just lastly, obviously the fund is, is active in nature. It's also active in terms of the sort of currency 
positions that it takes. Could you maybe just explain to listeners the importance of currency and, and give us an example of how you've taken advantage of currency? Yes, um, it, it is. I mean, we uh, most multi-asset funds, certainly our fund, we invest in global assets. We invest in uh, bonds uh, and equities that could be denominated in dollars, in Japanese yen, in euros, in Swiss franc, whatever, as well as some assets that are denominated in GDP. In sterling. Um, so when you have all of those, you know, you, you could have 70 or 80 percent of your portfolio uh, where the underlying investment is denominated in the currency that is not uh, uh, pound sterling. Um, and, and we always manage that risk in this portfolio. Some multi-asset funds would just not manage the currency risk. We've always managed currency risk. Um, and, and we can actually also use currency risk um, to enhance returns and to enhance income. So, for example, um, at the moment, we have uh, exposure to uh, the Brazilian real and the Mexican peso in the portfolio. Um, we like those currencies on a fundamental basis. We think those economies are in a, a, a good place relative to, to, to other economies, um, and, and they're doing quite well. And by investing in those currencies, Think of it, a currency, the way uh, listeners think of it is a currency is like the share price of your economy. So if your economy is doing well, your currency should do well and vice versa. Um, so, so if we think Brazil as an economy is going to do quite well uh, and, and we've got the risk appetite, the risk capacity, the risk budget to invest there, then we can invest in, in, in the Brazilian real and benefit from the Brazilian real doing relatively well against other currencies and it happens to be a, a very high attractive level of interest while you're invested in that. It's like, think of it as cash in the bank, but it's not sterling cash in the bank. It's Brazilian real cash in the bank earning over a 10% interest rate because that's what the short-term interest rate is in Brazil. Um, Vincent, once again, thank you very much for your time today. No, thank you, Chris. The Aegon Diversified Monthly Income Fund is well-diversified geography and across asset classes, targeting a 5% yield per year for investors. As Vincent has demonstrated in this interview, the managers will decide how much to allocate to equities, fixed income, property, and specialist income sectors in order to spread the risk and balance of sources of income. For more information on the Aegon Diversified Monthly Income Fund, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. Mm-hmm.